This week on The Futurists, Alan Wolk. I think AI is is going to completely change everything. I mean, I really feel like we are with AI, you know, in the sort of prodigy CompuServe days of the internet. Hey there, welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik, and this week I'm flying solo as my colleagues are traveling. But I've got a great guest here, a longtime friend and associate from my past, his present, and maybe our collective future, and that is the media business, a topic I just can't seem to get away from. I feel like the godfather it just keeps drawing me back in, no matter how much I try to get away from that. That's partly because media keeps expanding and absorbing more and more parts of society. And so the media sphere is ever expanding. And of course, the tech sphere is trying to absorb all of that. Here this week to help us understand what is happening in the world of media, entertainment, broadcasting, and streaming is an expert on the subject and a longtime friend of mine, Alan Walk. Alan, hi. Welcome to The Futurists. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Good to have you here. Um, so you have been, since we last saw each other, which is before the pandemic, Yeah, you've been very busy, very diligently building out TV Rev. Tell people what TV Rev is. Yeah, so TV Rev is an analyst firm. Um, we cover the sort of the future of television, the intersection of streaming TV and advertising and content. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out at this point four times a week. Um, different topics. Um, Friday is our flagship, the week in review. We've got hot list on on the weekend, which is a, a review of everything. Monday is thought leader circle, and Wednesday is the measure, um, which is all the sort of data stories. Thought Leader Circle is a content marketing program that we have for select companies in the industry. We kind of give them a voice. So you know, the idea behind it was so many of them create this really smart thought leadership stuff, and they put it up on their corporate blog where nobody sees it. Let's give them a, you know, a way to get it out to the world. I mean, we have you know over 50,000 subscribers to the newsletter, got about 300,000 followers on LinkedIn, so we can really give them a voice. Um, and that's oh. expanded from that into webinars and dinners and education, straight up consulting. So we've made it a business, which is very pretty cool. cool. Glad to hear it. And before that, when we met, you were an analyst. You were actually working yes. on, uh, as an analyst in the TV business. Uh, anyone in, who is listening to this podcast, if you're interested in what's happening with broadcasting, streaming, or the general media sphere, I highly recommend TV Rev. I subscribe, I read it all the time. It's filled with good information. It's also mercifully short and funny. Those are two things that are very appreciated in a world of newsletters. Thank you. Yeah, and we really strive, the funny part and the readable part is something we really strive for. The idea being, you know, nothing, it's it's television. Like it should yeah. be fun. And yeah. people don't wanna be bored when they're reading about business, like make yeah. it entertaining. So. It is entertaining and it's no tragedy. You know, if, if something yeah. happens to Warner Brothers or Disney, I think we can all smile because yeah, there. Um, speaking of which, the thing that has been on my mind is something that you and I talked about way back in the day. And I mean, like 2010, 2011, like when we first met, um, one of the things that was on my mind at the time was that there would be competing streaming services. And at that time, there was really just Netflix and Amazon Prime. Um, so that was a kind of fanciful notion because of, in those days, just to, just as recently as a decade ago, the big media companies were very bound up with the cable TV world and they were afraid to defy their cable masters uh, who threatened reprisals. You know, So in those days, if you were working at a cable TV channel and you decided you wanted to stream something or even put videos on your website, you would immediately get hassled by companies like Comcast and Time Warner Cable or now called Spectrum. Those companies are big, fat bullies, the network companies, and they didn't want to see any of their media companies kind of go off the reservation and try to go direct to consumer. That was just 10 years ago. Now, here we are today, and we've got the opposite scenario where everybody is streaming everything all the time through every con every conceivable platform. And for consumers, we are now in a world of fragmentation and kind of a bewildering sense of overchoice. There's just too much stuff on too many platforms. Give me a perspective from the consumer point of view of what's happening, the state of the industry right now? Well, it's confusing at AF uh, for consumers. Um, I don't know if I could curse on your pro on your on your show, but um that's I mean, the one thing, if there's one thing I hear 
from every friend of mine because you know I'm sure you get this. So they all think I I control television. So any yeah. any TV related complaint comes to me is yeah. they can never find anything. They're like I have no idea. Somebody told me about some show and I, you know and I have to go to Google to look it up to find out where it is. And sports fans are particularly frustrated because they have to, you know, they don't know where the games are and do they subscribe to this and where do they find it? And it's a pain in the ass overall. So, you know, back in the old days, there were blackouts, right? Sports, local sports companies didn't want local audiences, uh, you know, watching. They wanted them in the stadium. So, so there have always been some limitations. You had a geographic lockout on DVDs, so you couldn't stream you can play Japanese DVDs in America and so forth. So, you know, the content companies have always exercised their discretion to restrict our access to their content. That's kind of the business model. And I think that's what's been changing. And I think this is an interesting thing. People have noticed in the sense that now they have four or five sort of streaming services and it's never, never seems to be enough. Um, they've noticed, but they don't like it. Now, the funny thing about that, Alan, to me, is back when you and I first met, back in the early 2010s, the whole tech industry was was focused on you know dis, disaggregating the cable TV business. They wanted to unbundle cable. That was the big cree uh, at the time. And of course, they all were coming off of a big uh, victory lap because they'd just done that to the record industry. They had unbundled the CD, and music was available. Music was mainly available by a single download, but streaming was beginning. It was starting to take off, and everyone was like, "We're going to do the same thing with cable." And at that time, uh, just about a decade ago, the average person spent about $35 or $40 a month paying for cable TV. If you had a couple extra channels, maybe go up to 50 bucks. The high end was 75 bucks a month, unless you were a sports junkie and you had like, say, uh, uh, direct TV, um, then you'd spend over $100, but that's just for sports. That was like a fairly small audience. Most people, it was about 50 bucks a month they spent. Today, YouTube TV, which is the most popular streaming service on televisions is $75. Yeah. The the cost has gone up. In other words, you know, unbundling didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was give everybody access to everything. In fact, what it did was give us access to different segments and they all charge 15 or 20 bucks a month and now they have ads. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So we I just wrote about this a few months ago um and we talk about it a lot that the TV industry made a huge mistake back around the time when you and I first met each other. So if you remember at the time, what everybody was all excited about was that Netflix, it wasn't even so much the access, it was the ease. In other words, I could pause a show on Netflix in my living room, go upstairs to my bedroom, and then continue watching right where I left off. It was that sort of time shifting thing. And that's, you know, and then I could obviously watch anything on, you know, Netflix, everything was on demand. So I could, I had this access to this huge library whenever I wanted it. And that's really what consumers wanted, just, just that ease. And there was a lot of talk about something called TV Everywhere, that the various cable companies would be able to sort of take their you know cable package from the set top box and put it online and you would have access to it everywhere um and then all of the big media companies said nah we want to be the next netflix we're going to launch our own service carriage and retrans what and then they forgot about it and why are these guys all struggling because they don't get carriage and retrans fees from streaming. Okay, so hang on for a second, because not everybody listening to okay, this. Okay, yes, I will. I was going to the yeah. cable television business. So, tell us about cable retransmission fees. So there's two types. So retransmission fees are what is paid to a broadcast network. So that's NBC, ABC, and all their affiliates. For, by a cable, by you know Comcast or Charter or Verizon or YouTube TV for that matter, for the right to rebroadcast that over the over their cable carriage fee is a similar fee that goes for cable networks. So CNN and ESPN, Discovery Channel, those all pay carriage fees, and they are worth billions with a B of dollars. So I know that in third quarter, twenty twenty three. Fox had reported on their earnings call that they made 1.77 billion just in that quarter from those fees. So imagine that. So the estimates are somewhere between 10 and 20 billion dollars in 2024. 
And it was way more before that. And that is how a lot of them became profitable. It's also how they sustained this ecosystem where they were able to pay actors and writers and directors and craft services people really big sums of money and keep this business going ad sales people at the network it was a very very it was an insanely profitable business so the the closed the closed garden or the walled garden that the tech companies used to rail against and complain about and people were very angry at turns out to be the best business model for profit maximization ever invented for any media business bar none and that is to say cable tv channels just were crazy profitable um, now, about half of what you pay your cable company goes to content companies, roughly speaking, depending on the deal, depending on the care, depending on what your package is and so forth. Uh, there are a couple of cable channels that famously took the lion's share. ESPN is one of them. You mentioned them. Yeah. And because that was owned by Disney, they used it as leverage to ram through high fees for all their other channels. And so when you think of cable TV in the past, think of it as bundles. A yeah. channel is a bundle of shows. And then usually the companies that own a channel, they have several channels as a bundle of channels. And then those are grouped together in tiers. And then the customer at home has to choose tiers and the way they design that offering. You can never just get one. You had to buy a couple of tiers so they could kind of upsell you into extra tiers. And, um, and as a result, cable was really bundles inside of bundles inside of bundles. And bundling was the best business model ever invented for media. Yes. Now we've unbundled everything. And where do we stand? Is it profitable? Is this a good business? Is it good for consumers? We're paying more and watching less. So it seems, or or we're washing content, but we can't figure out where to find anything. Right. And, and if you have seen the term, the great rebundling, um, has, you know, which I've been, I saw that term on TV Rev. I saw that term in your newsletter. The great, tell me what that's about. That everybody is starting to bundle again because consumers are like, yeah, well, this is what we want. Like, I don't want to chase down eight different streaming bills and and a and a internet bill and everything else. So they're like, oh, we can just. So let me just step, take a step back. Mm-hmm. All of the cable, the, with a, the, what the media industry confusingly calls MVPD, which stands for multi-channel video. Um, programming distributor, um, which normal people call cable companies. So all the we'll call them cable companies for thank you. This pod, but so Mercy all the talk. cable companies also you also sell broadband, right? And that is how they are making their money these days. Um, they make a lot more money on broadband than they do selling TV. So they're like, yeah, we don't care. Like we don't care what kind of TV we sell. It's just a way to kind of it's a stickiness thing. It keeps people happy it keeps them in so yeah you want to sell you want you know we'll happily sell bundles of streaming services like you know and if you if you remember there was a big battle between charter and disney not that long ago where they were over the how much disney was going to pay them and one of the ways they settled it is they said oh dis we'll give disney subscribe charter will give disney subscribers a break in other words if you subscribe to disney through charter they get a price break and that was sort of the start you know one of the key things we're seeing verizon has a bunch of bundles now where like i think if you get ad supported and we'll circle back on that piece after ad supported um max and netflix i think it's ten dollars a month if you're a verizon subscriber so there's a lot of that going on and the thought is you know you can throw spotify in there audible you can throw in you know a washington post subscription doesn't only have to be tv but people just want the ease of being able to pay one bill and if it's slightly discounted all the better because everybody moved to a month to month subscription model and that's really hard if you're selling advertising Mm -hmm. because you need to be able to say okay in eight months we're going to have the same subscribers as we do now and if you get them in a one-year bundle you can do that so is that how it works the bundle is there to keep you from unsubscribing it's a retention mechanism that is exactly what it is so this is classic cable tv in other words we're seeing uh we thought we cut off the head of the hydra but now many other heads are reappearing uh, they're going to get us again. We're going to end up yes. taking our Apple TV and our YouTube TV and all these things that were meant to be outside the cable system. We're going to get them back from our cable provider or maybe our telco. You mentioned Verizon yeah. and at and uh, And for those companies, since they already have the billing relationship with the customer because you're getting broadband and maybe also your mobile phone service from them. Um, you know, if you don't if you're not interested in their TV offering, well, no problem. You can get streaming through them now as well. So for the consumer, it's one bill to manage. 
Um, I'm wondering, though, if they make it hard to unsubscribe, because famously, the cable companies were the most difficult companies to unsubscribe from. Right now, it's quite easy to unsubscribe from Netflix. People do it all the time, you know, especially the, the broadcasters streaming services. You can sign up for like the Olympics, watch for a couple of weeks and then cancel the service. So it's quite easy to churn in and out. And we've seen that, right? Churn numbers used to be low. Now churn numbers for streaming are extremely high. It's hard to keep customers subscribing. Uh, but this is a bunch of work for consumers, right? Because you have to like manage your subscriptions. As you said, several different bills. Um, what what I think people really want is to get everything on the same system. And that hasn't happened yet, where I can exit through one interface, I can see all the shows. I'd say Amazon's closest in my experience. It's some people like Roku. Um, you know, with Amazon, you got to pay. You know, you're, they're yeah. selling things a la carte. Um but now Amazon has done something that I think is just so deeply offensive and goes against the core proposition. I'm one of the very first people to sign up for Netflix and sign up for Netflix streaming. I was a huge fan of it from the very, very beginning because there were no ads. And the idea now that advertising is creeping back into streaming, uh, even when we're paying for it. This is annoying. And bear in mind, that happened with cable TV back in the 80s. You know, first in the in the earliest incarnation, cable TV networks didn't have ads either. But as soon as they got big enough and they had a narrow audience that they could define, they started selling ads against it. Streaming companies are trying to do the same, but it hasn't been that successful, right? Netflix stream, Netflix advertising supported tier is, uh, is, is not the big success case. That is correct. So what Amazon did, what Rob is referring to is... Nobody knows how many people subscribe for the free two-day shipping, how many people subscribe to watch the video, how many people subscribe because they get lower prices. But so this is just, Amazon Prime you're talking yes, about. Yes, the service Amazon. that costs, costs $136 a year for free two-day shipping and a bunch of other freebies, stuff that nobody looks at, like free Kindle books or some kind of like music service, um, free storage of photographs. Like It's a really random collection of stuff, all that lives in Amazon's cloud. But Amazon Prime Video is something people watch. We're not really sure how many people watch, though. Do you have data on that? Well, so what we, we, we've sort of done a rough estimate that, say, there's in the U.S., figure there's 170 million Prime subscribers overall. And of those being very, you know, sort of very conservative, half of them watch video on Amazon. So that's 85 million people. And... Of when we figure that maybe probably about 70% of them will stick with the ad supported version. So there's about 50 some odd million people who are suddenly on an ad supported subscription streaming service, which is a huge number. Now, the thing is that the other subscription services, Netflix, Disney, Max, Peacock, Paramount, they've all rolled out ad supported versions too, but they haven't had you know, massive uptake on that. And what we think is going to happen is that they're going to raise the prices on the ad free versions relative to the ad supported so that it's significant. Because right now it's not that much. It's generally anywhere from, say, 5 to $10. And if you think of the user journey, there's a show on Netflix I want to watch. I'm thinking it'll take me two months to watch it. And so for $10 more a month, I can watch it ad free. I'm going to go, yeah, why, why wouldn't I do that? But if it's but, suddenly, if it was forty dollars a month difference, then we or even twenty five dollars a month difference, then I'm like, yeah, I'll watch a couple ads. What the hell? You but, know? But, but 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 hang on a second. We're talking about bumping up the fee on a service that's already fifteen or twenty dollars a month, buying another ten bucks a month, and that's just one of. Usually, people have on average four services, right? I know people are trying to weasel out and cut back and trim the how many streaming services they subscribe to, but on average, it's somewhere between three and four. Uh, so we're talking about yeah, 60 bucks a month that we're already spending another 10 bucks. That starts to feel pretty painful to people, I think, after a while. Oh, yeah. It's and a, that that's feels like a dirty thing. trick to me. I thought about canceling Amazon Prime. I was like, no way. You guys, that's a bait and switch. They pulled the carpet out from under me and just stuck ads on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the idea is that they will, I mean, they will move it to, they, people will move to the ad supported version, right? Which will be a reasonable price, possibly less than what they're paying now. Now, what the big question is like, you know, will, can they control themselves and not stick more ads in? Like I've actually tried, I've watched the Amazon Prime with ads and it's actually not a bad experience. Like there's an ad, you know, the one minute ad break every so often and it's, you know, it's one minute and you're done and it's fine. 
and all that. And ideally, the ads will be much better targeted. But, you know, if it starts creeping up and it's like, you know, what we have now where it's five or six minutes, that's just going to be awful. It already is. That's why people yeah. don't watch TV. They've ruined it, right? In TV, you've got on average four commercial breaks in an hour. Each one right. has eight commercials. So we're just awash in commercials on, on ad-supported broadcast television. And there are terrible commercials, right? The, the problem is the commercials are all for like, you know, medical supplements and stuff. Yes. Things that remind you of human frailty and, and human shortcomings. So your TV is such a weird medium, if you think about it, because we've got all these stories of sh shows about heroes and anti-heroes. And then in between every eight or 10 minutes, you're going to get interrupted with eight short stories uh, about human frailty and weaknesses and shortcomings and in inadequacies in the form yes. of TV commercials. That's basically yes. The, yes. the payload of TV is like, you know, you're not good enough. You're too weak. You need to buy this thing. Oh, very much. And then it also raises the specter of something we, we've been calling 15,000 Merits. It's an episode of Black Mirror where there's, if you remember, the, it's a world where the currency is called merits and advertising is everywhere. The walls turn into ads and you can buy your way out of seeing the ad if you have a certain number of merits. And do we wind up in a situation where more affluent people pay more, you know, pay $40 a month for Netflix just because they want to avoid ads and it's not that much money for them? <laughs> so let's let, let's follow up on a couple questions on Amazon. The first thing that crossed my mind when I heard that they were adding advertising to Amazon Prime Video is, wow, for the first time, you've got an e-commerce giant with an everything store connected to television, and you're one click away from what we used to call television, interactive TV or TV TV commerce. Is that is that ultimately going to be uh, Amazon's gambit here? Are they aiming to just basically get you to buy, click and buy like, straight through from the ad? Oh, one hundred percent. They've already they've already implemented it. Um, they're testing it. Where if you ever watch Amazon, they have this feature called X Ray. When you pause the TV, a little bios of the actors and you know show up on the bottom. Maybe something about the scenery or the song that's playing. And now they've started putting products in there. So you can just click on that and buy it. They have also started a self-serve ad business. What is self-serve? So if you all remember back in the day when Net, when Facebook got caught up in that Cambridge Analytica thing and everybody was saying, oh, we need to boy get advertisers to boycott Facebook. And then they realized, oh, wait, that doesn't really matter because most of Facebook's business comes from small and medium businesses that do these self-serve ads. Based self-serve is exactly what it sounds like. You go on, you create your own ad and you place it yourself and it works. And so they can do that on TV now because there's AI companies that will make a TV commercial for you. I mean, it won't be a Nike commercial, but it'll probably be better than a late night car dealer commercial. I've seen them. There's a company out of Detroit called Waymark that does some of this, you know, and it, and, and it is like grandma level. I mean, grandma, grandpa level, like where anyone can do this. Um, and so like a little merchant, a local store could, yes. could, could create their own TV ad yes. using an AI tool from Amazon. That's right. And then I don't know if that Amazon uses Waymark, but they have one. And then you run and then it goes to your target audience, which and Amazon knows everything about you because it's prime and you've been buying stuff on prime all along. Even better if it's a merchant who sells things on prime. Right. If there's a lot of merchants that only sell on Amazon and right. they run the ad, you click you and Amazon has all your credit card and where you're shipping to and boom, easy peasy. One click TV television. Yep. Okay, we're going to take a little break here. Um, I'm with Alan Walk. You're listening to The Futurists. And please stay tuned because in the second half, we're going to get super futuristic, people. Back in a sec. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support The Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the FinTech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one FinTech podcast and radio show. 
Hey there, welcome back to The Futurist. Thanks for holding on through our break. This is my friend, Alan Walk from TV, TV Rev, which is a great newsletter if you're interested in the media and entertainment business. Alan's been covering this space as an analyst for a couple of decades, and he's been running TV Rev for about 10 years, and it's grown great right now. And today we're talking about the future of media and the meltdown that seems to be happening in the uh, streaming TV business right now. Uh, right before the break, we are talking about Amazon. And I think it's worthwhile for people to understand just the scale of Amazon's business. Um, back in the pandemic, in the third quarter of 2020, Amazon posted $5 billion of revenue as an uh, advertising platform. And a lot of that was the ads that you see on Amazon. If you're just shopping around on the Amazon.com site, you'll see ads kind of like the way they're end cap and special displays in a retail shop. Uh, but in Amazon, it's all virtual. So those, those take the form of ads. But they generated $5 billion of income in Q3 of 2020. Here it is just three years later. And they now have posted $14.7 billion in a quarter, a, a threefold increase in ad revenue. And just to put that in perspective, that's about $15 billion in one quarter in advertising revenue. That's more than Snap, YouTube, and Walmart combined in their advertising. So this is an incredible growth. I think advertising on Amazon is the fastest growing ad platform in the world. But if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. It's where the it's where the customers are. It's where the shopping happens. Everybody's got an Amazon account. So at least in the United States, this seems like an obvious next move. Tell me a little bit about what Walmart has done recently to respond to Amazon's dominance in advertising. Well, Amazon, I mean, well, me, Walmart went and bought Vizio, which is one of the largest TV manufacturers in the United States. Um, they are a unique company for a number of reasons, but one being that they are U.S. only. They really only sell their television sets in the United States. Um, and they have a huge network. The other thing that's really unique about them is that they have a data company attached to them called Inscape, and they collect you know, viewership data around it. They've been using that. They built up their own fast service called Watch Free Plus on Vizio TVs. And the uh, sus you know, suspicion, we don't, we don't really know much yet, but the suspicion is obviously that Walmart will use that as a in to sort of take on Amazon and, you know, and start selling their own products in their own version of Prime. So that means, so to just, uh, to, just to de demystify some of the jargon for the listeners here, um, Vizio is a TV manufacturer, but they own what's called a fast channel. A fast is a um, free ad supported streaming television, a term coined by none other than Alan Walk, the TV analyst. So we're talking to you right now. Fast are the one of the fastest growing segments of the TV business. We should probably spend a second talking about that. Yeah. So, but but in a kind of a stunning move, I think uh, Walmart, who famously is hard on their suppliers, um, went, ended up buying a TV company, and clearly they're going to make super affordable television sets. They're going to undercut that space, maybe even subsidize the TV sets in order to get a Trojan horse in your home. That Trojan horse will be delivering a payload of targeted ads. Doesn't that mean Walmart needs to then buy Paramount and Warner Brothers in order to fill that TV set with some content? No, I mean they they have they have Watch Free Plus. They have you know they have a great service there um, that they've built up. Um, so a fast service just so we 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 should probably use this to explain that. So there's a fast service uh, which is some you know there's sort of two flavors of those. There's the ones that are attached to devices so watch free plus on vizio samsung tv plus lg channels the roku channel and amazon has something called freebie that is attached to the device itself so it's sort of the centerpiece when you turn on the tv that's what you see that's sort of the the backbone if you will of the interface um and they you know it has most you know a little bit of original content but it's mostly library you know rerun content but it's stuff that people really like to see and some of it is linear channels, which was sort of something that everybody had thought had gone away when we moved to streaming. But there's a real heart for linear channels. Some of those they buy directly from a studio. Others they will you know, sort of curate themselves. It depends. Um, 
And then there's also on demand. And there is increasingly, you know, it's you can sort of do both, right? So you can start watching on a linear channel. And then ideally, if it's something you want to watch more of or earlier episodes, you go to the on demand. Some stuff is only available on one or the other. The second flavor of Fast are the ones that are owned by the major media companies. So that's Pluto TV, which is owned by Paramount, Zumo, which is Comcast, and Tubi, which is Fox. Um, and those have, you know, those sort of a different purpose. Um, they have a lot more u- exclusive content because they get it from the parent company um, and they have the rights to that. And then they also ideally promote the subscription app from the parent company and also give them more places to run ads. So Paramount, if you buy off of Paramount, you can buy Paramount ads on Paramount Plus, a subscription service and on Pluto. So that's sort of a nice extra. And obviously it's on every device as opposed to the others are only on their own devices. All right, but now hang on a second, because we started the show talking about fragmentation and how hard it is to find a show in streaming TV, how, how challenging and how frustrating and annoying that is for TV audiences. And what you're telling me now is in fact, we're getting even more fragmentation because there's two flavors of fast channels. And now most of the streaming platforms, the subscription streaming platforms, have introduced an ad-supported tier, which will have a slightly different combination of content, no doubt, because there's ads on some and premium and some other. So it seems like we're getting into ever finer slices of uh, of TV programming and packaging, ever narrower channels, and all these complex interfaces to get in and out of them. By the way, I don't happen to think that those TV, those built-in channels that come with your TV service, like Samsung or LG, I don't happen to think those are very good. They're not that easy to navigate. They're not that useful to me. Um, it's certainly not something I wanted. It just showed up one day on my TV set. So I think from the consumer standpoint, uh, consumers are getting lost in a thicket of differing streaming options, uh, on-demand options and so forth. I think they're getting increasingly frustrated. Are they tuning out or are we watching TV more than ever? I think we're watching more than ever. I mean, again, remember, like what you and I think is good and like is not what most people think is good and like. Right now, I mean, this is a really, really important thing because the media, the people in Hollywood in particular tend to forget. And it all goes. So this this is one of my big shibboleths. So I'm going to I'm going to. So if you remember in the last year or so, there were two articles that came out that were sort of presaged this. So one of them was, I believe it was in New York Magazine, and it was quoting an anonymous, they both quoting anonymous executives, anonymous Hollywood executive saying that, so, you know, that Netflix needed to stop making, quote, snobby shows that nobody yeah. wants to watch, unquote. Um, and the, uh, the second one was a, a different article, a quote from an agent who's saying, yeah, all my writers want to write for Barry, which is an HBO, sort of a high-end HBO sitcom. And you know who watches Barry? No one, end quote. <laughs> um, and his point, and it was in a point about, you know, nobody wants to write sort of more popular, you know, poor popular fare. And if you look at Netflix's most recent self-reported ratings, their two top shows are something called Ginny and Giorgio, which is a show kind of like the Gilmore Girls and something called The Night Agent, which has like about a 60% rating on tomato meter. It's a very sort of pop cult, you know. So again, like, and and we saw this in the early days of TV too. Our, our friend Seth Shapiro wrote a book about the TV industry back in the day. And I remember one of the most interesting things was in the 50s, you had that first golden age where you had all of these like really great shows, you know, Studio 90 and, you know, Marty and Judgment at Nuremberg. And why was that? It was because the people who owned TVs back at that time were more educated and more affluent and they wanted that sort of stuff. And then when it became much more mass market, they shifted to, you know, Petticoat Junction and Green Acres. Um, And the same thing is sort of happening with streaming, that in the early days, it was a much more Tech, technologically advanced, educated, affluent audience, and they wanted more, basically more HBO, right? They want, you know, what was Netflix and Amazon and Hulu at that time, but just sort of an extension of HBO were the sort of shows that were aimed at that audience. But now that we've got the mass audience, you have, you know, the Night, Night Agent and Ginny and Georgia. That's what people want to watch. And to go back, they think those other shows are, you know, the shows that you and I like are, are snobby and they don't get them. I mean, you know, we always joke Barry, which is about a comedy, I, which I think is very funny, a very funny comedy about a hitman. You know, the comment is like, 
why is that funny? He kills people, you know, and that's, you know, and, and that's a lot of what's happening now in streaming. And that's why the fast services are popular because people like watching comfort food TV. They like the, the yeah. idea of linear channels and being able to turn on, you know, a show that they had watched, you know, the Andy Griffith show channel, the Bob Ross channel, whatever it is, and just watch reruns while they're doing something else. Well, and, and sitcoms in particular, right? So that's yeah. one particular format that broadcast TV excelled at. And you're right. I personally thought they were formulaic and trite and kind of corny, but doesn't matter what I think because I don't matter in terms of TV viewing audience. So what matters is the people who show up and watch those shows. Lots of people like them. And that golden age really you know, began in the 60s with the shows that you mentioned, you know, My Mother, The Car or uh, or um, Bewitched, you know, those kinds of shows. And then Norman Lear gave it new life in the 70s and they became kind of like a little more politically astute, a little more provocative. And then by the 80s, you had all sorts of interesting versions of that. We, we don't give the sitcom enough credit. It's not taken seriously enough. And it's something streaming services have failed completely to launch. They have not innovated in this space in a successful way. They've tried a few things. What you get on streaming is dystopian sci-fi and anti-hero shows, you know, bad guys. And, and they're great at it. I don't know why, but like streaming services seem to be superb at giving us anti-heroes. What does that say about us as a culture? Why is that? What, what is that? Give me the sense of what the cultural commentary is there. I think that the audience that those shows are aimed at likes that because it's different it, it sort of says hey i'm edgy i can appreciate this it's not you know not the standard trite and true and, and you know at some level it probably reflects sort of a, a nihilism in our culture in our current culture and people sort of that's what i'm we, driving at yeah, that's exactly what i'm curious about you know like a lot of folks this comes as nothing original to say that the united states is polarized politically right now that we seem to be in warring tribes who can't even see each other as entirely human uh, that seems to be our political situation. But I wonder how much of that stems from the fact that we no longer watch the thing, same things and we've lost that cultural vernacular, that, that sort of show in common that we both love to tune in and watch, even if we don't agree politically. Uh, now, everybody's in their own bubble, really, their own media bubble. Is that is that an accurate statement? A hundred percent, Rob. I have, I, I have said that as well and thought that and that's probably where I got oh. the idea from, you know, I'm sure. Possibly, <laughs> I'm no, probably, possibly, but I mean, I, I'm clearly not the first person who said that either. But yeah, we, we don't have that. You know, if you think about it, like up until even the cable, you know, cable really took off. There were three channels and everybody watched the same shows. And maybe some people yeah. like really like them. Some people, you know, rolled their eyes at them. But there was stuff there and, there, you know, and there was stuff that was good, and, you know, that was a little bit, you know, more intelligent than others. And, and it what kind of had a harmonizing yeah. effect, right? It had a yes. harmonizing effect when Walter Cronkite would come on the news and he would say, that's the way it is. The whole country listened to him, right? Yeah. Now, now, critics like Noam Chomsky would say, well, that was manufactured consent. Uh, the very powerful, very powerful media companies basically manufactured the narrative that glued us together. Perhaps that's true. Well, that story is no longer the case. Now it's fragmented beyond belief and those media companies are still quite powerful. But they seem to be pushing narratives that pit us against each other. And you know what's interesting? We learned this from Facebook. Angry people click. Hate watching yep. is a thing. People love to get energized, right? One of the things I noticed across all media, including social media, is the rise of outrage culture. People are in a permanent state of outrage, and they consume media that keeps them in that state, that sort of state of perpetual shock and rage. I find it exhausting and kind of trite, candidly, but lots of people seem to tune into that. Um, I want to yeah. shift the subject a little to the article that I sent you because um, sure. last week, uh, a, a guy that writes about music brilliantly, Ted Gioia, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, his his uh, newsletter is called The Honest Broker. And in The Honest Broker, he published a piece last week that got a lot of attention. It was uh, called The State of the Culture 2024. So you can find this if you look for a substack called The Honest Broker. In that, uh, Ted talked about what's happening in the media world. And he said, in a perfect world, you'd have arts and entertainment. But he said, we don't live in a perfect world. So we have small arts and a huge entertainment category. But the entertainment category itself is now being absorbed by something else. And he didn't say technology. He said it was being absorbed by distraction media. Distraction media doesn't really tell a narrative. It just kind of keeps you engaged or maybe enraged. Uh, you're constantly reacting to it. It's hard to switch away from. And so he said, there's even a bigger, bigger thing underfoot, which is... Uh, underway, which is uh, addiction. Uh, 
So in his view, arts is being absorbed by entertainment and entertainment's being absorbed or surpassed by distraction. And distraction is just a subset of addiction. And then he talked about all the different ways that our media is designed to addict us. Um, I found that to be quite powerful because what uh, Ted ends with is this chart that's been widely copied where he talks about the rise of dopamine culture where sports, you know, athletics has gone from playing a sport to watching a sport on TV to gambling on a sport today. Or where newspapers went from, you know, newspapers to multimedia papers to clickbait uh, on the web, clickbait headlines. Um, and, uh, and the idea that we went, you know, even he takes it as broadly as, uh, as relationships. We went from courtship and marriage to modern culture, gave us sexual freedom and hookups. And now we have dopamine culture that gives us the ability to just swipe on an app and click and tap and so forth. So it's a combination of accelerating culture, but also low stakes engagement and a sense of perpetually being on this treadmill where you're stimulated, 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 stimulated. And he says, ultimately, we get exhausted by that and people drop out. Your take. Yeah, I mean, so I think that, you know, anything dystopian like that tends, you know, t tends to get a lot of play, especially with a certain type of person. I mean, I think he had, I mean, you know, it's not news that like this stuff is designed to be addictive and whatnot. I just think that more people resist it and drop out. And then it's like any drug, right? Like, you know, heroin, cocaine, you know, a certain number of people will get addicted and, and have terrible consequences from it. But by and large, most people resist it or get into it for a while and go, gosh, this is just really awful and, and move away from it. I mean, none of, you know, I mean, think about Facebook, right? Is anybody, you know, like, like we're, we're old and like, like I'm not, you know, like, I, like nobody I know is really on Facebook anymore. I mean, you know, my same age friends, like they don't, you know, they barely use it. Maybe they'll like, you know, on their birth birthday or some, you know, somebody gets married, they'll post something. That's about it. It's not the engagement that you had a while ago. Well, that's and, partly a function yeah. of the fact that three quarters of the page on Facebook is advertising. It's stuff you're not interested in, right? They're yes. just ramming things at you or recommending posts or sponsored posts or something like that. Yeah. It's what Cory Doctorow calls in shitification. When you get to a certain amount of density, when you get a certain number of viewers or big enough, you know, enough attention yeah. aggregated on your platform, you can then start to monetize by ramming stuff down people's throats or ramming it into their eyeballs, even yeah. stuff that they're not interested in looking at. And that ultimately degrades the experience. And you're right. People have stopped looking at Facebook. They've migrated to, to Meta's other platforms, Instagram and, uh, and WhatsApp, because it's a relatively cleaner experience in terms of ads, although that's starting to change now too. Certainly on Instagram, it's a lot more cluttered. Yes, and Instagram keeps trying to push me to threads. Um, and yeah, that's right. But like, but that, but another thing, like X is kind of like X, you know, people are X using is a, X is accessible. But even yeah. Google search, right? Google search is greatly degraded from where it was just twenty years ago. So right. Google search used to be delightful because it worked so well. Like the thing, you, yeah. there's a button. I'm, you know, I'm feeling lucky. That was actually pretty good. Now Google search, the first two pages is completely gamed by people who are fighting for your attention. It's a whole sub industry that people don't know about. Yeah. Um, sometimes called clickbait. Sometimes it's called search optimization. But in other, in, inevitably, the way you look at it is Google search just isn't as good as it used to be. And it means that Google is actually vulnerable to getting knocked off by the new kid on the block, which might be ChatGPT or something similar. It's certainly why Microsoft is investing so much in open AI, because they think that artificial intelligence will knock off search. Yes. Tell us a bit about what you see happening with AI right now in the media business. Well, I've seen, it's interesting with search that Google now, every so often, if I'll ask it a, an open question, will give me a AI, you know, their AI called Gemini um, created response. And, it's, and most of the time it's, it's correct, especially if it's something like, you know, how do I reset the X on my refrigerator? You know, am I, <laughs> yeah. whatever, like it, you know, it'll find the actual, uh, you know, the, the right article, um, other stuff it might, it probably will struggle with. But I think AI is is going to completely change everything. I mean, I really feel like we are with AI, you know, in the sort of prodigy CompuServe days of the internet. Like yeah, when that's a good analogy. When you kind of go, okay, like if you remember back, like, you know, you go on prodigy to look up the weather and it could take you 15 minutes and your friends would be like, you could go to this store, buy the newspaper and come back in that you know in less time but you're like but one day i'll be able to do this instantly and i sort of feel that with a lot of chat gpt stuff where you know 
some stuff it's very cool other stuff it's just like i just wasted an hour trying to get it to do something i could have done myself in five minutes but knowing that it can do that it will do that in five seconds in the future you know all this stuff is going to change i mean you know we could do more like a year's worth of episodes on on how how ai could change entertainment i'll talk about the positive things that it's going to be able to do which is in terms of discovery and you know and and that work it'll actually learn your preferences on shows be able to do a much deeper dive the metadata on tv has been terrible until now because no one bothered when they digitize tv shows they just be like seinfeld comedy and that'd be it where now the ai can go through and pick out what's happening in scenes and dialogue so you can do a much more natural language search for a certain show where it'll know you know find commonalities so that'll be great given the vast amount of options that we have that's true. So you can just say, hey, show me the Seinfeld show where he said that funny thing, master my domain, and and it'll take you straight to that clip or straight to that segment. Exactly. That makes a good deal of sense. So there's a lot of news right now about AI. Uh, you know, I live in Hollywood where last year uh, the guilds, the three big uh, talent guilds, spent most of the year on strike um, protesting some pretty reasonable things that they wanted to see in their contract, including, uh, you know, salary adjustments for inflation and so forth. But among their principal complaints was artificial intelligence. It was a big burning issue. And it ended up being one of the issues that held up that strike from being resolved. It took so long to resolve because the studios didn't want to give an inch. The movie studios and the TV companies, they wanted to retain the right to experiment with AI. In the end, the strike settled because they, uh, the big studios offered concessions to the guilds saying that they would not use uh, artificial intelligence on literary material and they wouldn't use it to replace actors and so forth. Uh, so the, the the studios conceded the point, but only for three years. Mm. And according to rumor, um, when Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, walked out of the negotiations, he turned to one of his associates and said, that is the last deal we're going to negotiate with the Writers Guild. Because mm. in three years, the AIs will be good enough that we won't need to negotiate with human writers again. What's your perspective on the introduction of AI into the filmmaking and television business? Um, it's going to take way longer than three years. Because um, the one thing, to go back to your very first point, was when we first met each other, everybody, ourselves included, thought that the TV industry was going to get disrupted almost as quickly as the music industry. And here we are 15 years later, and it's kind of sort of disrupted, but kind of sort of not. You know what I mean, like... Most people still have a cable subscription, right? Yes, it's down It's down from 90% to 65 or 70%, but that's still most people. Um, you know, there's a lot more streaming services. Like some stuff has changed, but it certainly hasn't changed nearly as quickly as anybody thought it would. So I think that all this, you know, that a lot of the AI stuff is going to take a really long time. I think AI is going to be useful. Like put it this way, I could see in three years of an AI could write the script for house hunters where it's just like, okay, you know, describe or for a documentary where you sort of tell it what, you know, what you want it to say and it does it and somebody oversees it and, you know, and sort of makes it, makes it more into English, but actually writing a story that's, that's way more than three years away. So I've been working with a group of technologists who want to create an AI movie studio. And we have an appropriately long timeline because we don't think that's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But we do spend time every single week comparing notes about the different tools that are available. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new tool was introduced. I know you know this. You know where I'm heading. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been various tools introduced over the last two years. Everyone's familiar with ChatGPT, where you can text in a prompt and it will give you a written thing back that sometimes is quite elaborate, sometimes wildly hallucinogenic. Um, and then there were the image generating apps, things like Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion, the various apps that are built on Stable Diffusion, Stability AI, and so forth. These apps, you could type in a text prompt and it would give you an image. And just two years ago, those were terrible apps. I mean, the images were just laughably, hilariously terrible, but they got better and better on a monthly basis. It's actually ex quite extraordinary to see how good Mid Journey is, the latest two versions. I'm a fan. I'm a subscriber. I love messing around with them. To me, it's more fun to make images on Mid Journey than it is to watch television. But where things were lagging was video. And there were a couple of companies that were trying to use Stable Diffusion as a basis for generating images. But the way it worked is it would generate an image and then it would try to guess the next frame and guess the next frame. So if there was an artifact or a mistake in the first frame, 
it would get amplified and distorted even worse as more frames are generated. As a result, services like Runway never really blew my mind. Uh, I never really signed up for it even because I thought the output was so bad. But all of this changed very quickly. Uh, a friend of mine at OpenAI sent me a text and said, check this out. And they just launched a thing called Sora. This was about 10 days ago for the people who are listening. Sora generates very, very, very high definition video that's awfully good. It's not perfect. If you look closely, there's artifacts and glitches in just about every clip that they share. Not available to the public yet, so we don't actually know what it's like to use it. That said, the quality of the video is night and day different from the generative apps that we've seen so far. And so this, uh, th this promises that there'll be some acceleration in the ability for AI to generate good video. Still lots of work to do, but it was sufficient for Tyler Perry to put on hold his plans to expand his movie studios. He owns 14 movie sound stages in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was going to do an $800 million expansion of that campus. And he decided to put that on hold after he saw Sora from OpenAI. And personally, I think that was a smart move, Alan, because it doesn't mean he's not going to build the rest of his studio. It just means he's going to hang on to his cash for a minute and see where this goes. I mean, ultimately, if it's possible to generate video without a movie camera and without a soundstage and without a crew, that's going to be a good thing for movie studios, not a bad thing. It disrupts the process of making films, but it does not disrupt the process of being a studio or distributing. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, and I think we're going to see things like that. And I also think that we're also going to see humans sort of figure out, OK, how can we do stuff that only a human could do that's better? You know, it's sort of like it's 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 almost like the way someone had described it, which I thought made a lot of sense. I won't take credit for this. It's sort of like, you know, getting, you know, handmade, handmade, whatever, you know, like, you know, couture clothing or you know something that that was sort of made by an artisan versus something that was mass produced, and that's going to be the big difference. Like, like handmade television made by humans for humans, as opposed to machine made. I have a theory that that um, if generative capabilities get better, and I think that's inevitable. So I think that's a pretty safe bet. It might take a while, to your point, but it's not going to be forever. It will be years, not decades. You'll be able to generate your own movies, and you'll be able to share them because that content will not be copyrightable. Generative content, the Copyright Office has already told us, anything generated by a machine cannot be copyrighted. So that means that that content will be free to distribute, which means that some really enterprising teenager in his mom's basement in New Jersey, or maybe in Sri Lanka, or maybe someplace else in the world, an enterprising teenager will be able to produce his or her own TV network in the future, just generating story after story after story. Sounds fanciful, might take a few years, I think it's inevitable. I think we're going to get to hyper-localized content and hyper-personalized content. I think it's going to happen within a decade. What's your take? Yeah, I think we will see some of that. I think it's going to be much more like the influencer thing, too, where, you know, certain people are able to sort of build up a following. And, and, and then I also think we're going to run into the same problem that a lot of these influencers have, which is that it's a fairly unsustainable lifestyle for you know for more than a couple of years that yeah you know, they all come back and go yeah i was making a lot of money but like i slept three hours a day and all i was doing was like creating comment content responding to people i tried hiring people you know to do some of the stuff it didn't work so i think we're going to have a lot of that i think you still need a large yes you know there are people who will be able to do this stuff but i think you still need a larger mechanism a, a studio a company a, a you know something larger to actually distribute it on a mass basis. And, you know, and there'll be both. I mean, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, you know, yeah. that people will be able to make the equivalent of, you know, of whatever they do on TikTok or YouTube now a lot quicker, a lot more of it. You also have like, you know, most of it's not good, right? Like, you know, it's like what finds an audience. And again, to our earlier point, you know, what you and I consider is good, what critics consider good is not necessarily what the mainstream public will consider. Yeah, good. That, so, that's a really important point. In the age of Google, good is in the eye of the beholder, right? So the yeah. person who's doing the search decides whether or not something is quality based on the results that they get. Um, and look, there is plenty of evidence now from YouTube that this isn't just a theory. There are plenty of solo creators who have audiences larger than TV networks. This is mind blowing. You're right, most of them are bad. Most of what's streamed on YouTube is not good quality, but that could also be said of television. You know, not all of television was uniformly good as well. 
And presumably there were editors and producers and people with some know-how who were making a decision there. So a lot of it didn't even get produced. Here on YouTube, uh, today on YouTube and TikTok, there's no barrier to entry. So anybody can produce anything. So you have a lot more garbage, sure. But the ratio of good to bad probably hasn't changed that much. Maybe less than 10% is good. That 10% though is as good as it gets. Yeah. So shows like Mr. Beast are actually pretty impressive. You know, a single guy producing all these shows and basically getting an audience bigger than a cable network. That's astonishing to me. And I think we'll see more of that in the future as the barriers go down and as the cost of entry get in. Give me a couple of predictions for where you think things will be in 10 years. Will we still have a Warner Brothers or will it be Warner slash Disney slash Paramount slash Fox slash Sony slash 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 all consolidated into one thing? Well, I think we will definitely see consolidation. Now, if they're smart, what they will do is go, you know what? Our enemy is not each other. It is Google and Amazon and Alphabet, you know, and um, and Meta. Why don't we all get together and you know and and sort of negotiate as one? And others like you know with sports, like if they all they're trying in, to do that with sports, it didn't but, work. But but sort CBS of CBS is like, no way, we're not in, right? But they didn't. They like I, I'm not. I don't know why CBS and NBC were not part of that deal. Whether they didn't ask them, whether they turned it down, I have no idea. But like. You needed all of them. You needed like, because otherwise it's sort of like that. And you would know this better than I would. Remember there was that, I can't think of the name of it. That there was a bunch of the record labels tried to create sort of like a, their own Napster thing, but it wasn't all of them. And people were like, Press well, play. I don't know what song Press I play. want. No, it sucks. Because here's the problem. I mean, I, I know that story very, very well. Yeah. So um, the record, record industry, the record companies hate each other more than they hate the Napsters of the world. And so they cannot get along. I, I've worked on so many projects with the music industry where we try to get them to play nicely. They can't do it. I think the same is true of the motion picture companies. Even that sports deal where you had like not all, but most of the major uh, broadcasters combining to say, hey, we're going to try to create one sports offering for the sports fan. It's a pretty good idea. They'd have a lot of bargaining power. They couldn't get everybody into the tent because they weren't able to make it fair or equal. Even in the deal that we heard about, that you know, yeah. that, that thing, um, ESPN still got the lion's share. Why? It doesn't make any sense. That's not reasonable. So that's a deal that's designed to be broken. I have a lot of skepticism uh, of partnerships like that. I think the only thing that works in the media business is acquisitions. And those always get botched. The only acquisition of a media company that's been successful, as far as I'm aware, in the last 20 years, is uh, Comcast buying NBC. And everyone thought that would fail, but they did an excellent job of implementing that, of making sure that the integration was successful. All the other big media industry takeovers have been a disaster, namely AT&T buying Time Warner, destroying tens of billions of dollars of value. So we shall see what happens next. I think that there will be a merger. I mean, you have to imagine Paramount is for sale right now. Yeah, right? I think stripping. there's going to be, but it's right, you know, History would say that we'll wind up with three or four big media companies because that's happened with pretty much every industry where there's been consolidation. I mean, think of, you know, think of mobile phones, right? It was, yeah. you know, there were like, I don't know, dozens of them back when, when they you know, deregulated. Now we're down to three. Yeah, um, but bear in mind with mobile phones, right? The companies that created that industry were Motorola, Ericsson. Nokia, none of them are in the phone business anymore. Right. They all got blown out of it. The companies that made the smartphones were companies like Palm and Research in Motion. They got blown out of the water. The people yeah. that succeeded were the big tech companies, Apple and Google. I think that's going to happen again. You know, for yeah. 100 years, these five big media companies have dominated Hollywood, but now they're one by one being picked off and absorbed. MGM is now part of Amazon. Yes. Yeah. And owns, yeah. Sony no, owns Columbia, right? It's a right. fucking tri Who's yeah. going to buy who's going to buy Warner Brothers? Do you think Apple will end up buying Warner uh, Warner Discovery? I I I give it up on trying to predict what Apple will do. Um you know, they Apple TV Plus is actually a good service, but no one's really sure what the business model is. It's like, okay, is this just supposed to be like, you know, a marketing tool for Apple? Do they want it to be, you know, an actual thing and they, you know, and they're, that they're going to expand or are they just going to leave it? So you know why didn't why didn't they, yeah they basically seeded the t the device market to Roku by keeping the Apple TV device priced at one hundred and eighty dollars when everybody else was selling them for twenty nine dollars and people go you know what like it's maybe five percent less good than the Apple TV but it's not like I'm not paying you know six or seven x for this this thing so I don't know what Apple is actually thinking 
I do think that the tech companies have a huge advantage because it's not their primary business, right? It's a hobby for them at some level. And it's a way to fuel into another business that they all have, which is advertising. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think they're at a huge advantage. Um, I think we're going to start seeing, you know, everything play out much more globally. I think, you know, one of the one of the big things that we're watching at TV Rev is something we're calling the OS war. So the operating system of your TV set. And it's really sort of a three-way battle. You've got the CE manufacturers, consumer electronics manufacturers, namely LG and Samsung on one hand, they're global companies. This is what they do. You have Google and Amazon, you have Google and Amazon who make the interfaces for TVs. And then you have a whole bunch of independent white label companies. I don't think no one's gonna win or lose, but it's a battle for market share. Of operating systems on yes. TVs. I exactly. know how that's gonna play out because I used to work for Sony. Hardware companies can't make software, full stop. Like I would yeah. not bet on a consumer electronics company to be successful in making software because they've never done it. The only one in the whole history of consumer electronics is Apple. It's the only company that has actually yeah. succeeded in, in, in wedding software and hardware together and being successful with it. I don't think Samsung has a prayer of winning an OS war. We already have two operating systems. There's iOS and there's Android. What what do you need a third one for? Tell me well, what that, that's. Is. Those are not TV. iOS is not a TV operating system. It's it's they don't. Apple has a really minimal share, and they haven't gone after that market at all. And you have in the U.S. you have Roku is actually the you know the dominant company, and Roku does not have any real any real presence outside the U.S. I mean they have some in Canada and Latin America, a little bit of a beachhead in Europe, but it's it's really fascinating because whoever owns the operating system owns everything, right? They you know what apps get on there, how the advertising works, you know what programming. There's there's a whole lot of the data around what's being watched. There's a whole lot of value in owning the operating system. Um, and you've got, you know, hundred, a couple hundred small manufacturers all around the world. It's a, it'll be a very interesting thing to watch play out over the next 10 years or so. Right on. Well, Alan Walk, thank you very much for joining us. How can people find you on the web? If people are listening, they want to hear more about your thoughts and your views on media, where should they go? Just to tvrev.com. That's T-V-R-E-V, just like it sounds, tvrev.com. Very cool. Alan, thanks for joining us on The Futurists. And folks, we'll be back next week with yet another person who's thinking about shaping and influencing the future. And I want to thank our friends at Provoke Media who make the show possible. So Lisbeth Severins, our producer, and Kevin Hirshhorn, our, our engineer, and all the folks at Provoke. Thank you all very much for making the show possible. And of course, thanks to our listeners because your audience, the audience that's out there and your support is what makes this show tick we love hearing from you please don't stop sending us questions and ideas and suggestions through social media and um we'll be back next week so until then we will see you in the future well that's it for the futurists this week if you like the show we sure hope you did please subscribe and share it with the people in your community and don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show and you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.